you always want to say something, to communicate, to hear something, to think. But if we are using devices to do this communication, the mobile phones, the smart devices that we have, the challenge that we have is the cost. It is expensive. So I will, in my talk, present the techniques to make communication in the next 50 years to be cheap. Because naturally, as human beings, we love to communicate. Someone somewhere will be saying, I love you. And I know that even though it's only human beings that have, been, have demonstrated to love to communicate, devices today, tomorrow, and in the future, they also would like to communicate. If you have two cell phones, for example, one cell phone will be interested to talk to the other. How much airtime do you have? <laughs> can you talk to my boss or my owner? Or can you do this for me? So devices would want to talk. If one phone has a better camera than the other, based on the megapixels, this other phone will ask, can you take the picture for me and send it using the app? application to me. So in that way, we are looking or waking, moving towards an era of the internet of things, where devices will be connected one to the other, people will be connected one to the other, but also devices connected to the people. So in this way, as we sit it here, a camera, security camera at your, your house should be doing all the surveillance to you, and you can be getting that information using the cloud as a service, cloud computing. And then you check whatsoever is happening there, hand over communication from one to the other. At the moment, it's expensive. The bandwidth is exorbitant. Transit costs are simply you know, unimaginable. So these are the things that we would like to address. So first of all, what we have to do is go back 50 years, for example, like for example in Malawi. How was communication like if we wanted one to talk to the other you know, by some kind of electrical or engineering form? What was the typical primitive shadow-like approach so I would show you maybe what you're familiar with. I, for one, when I was four or five years old, I thought about the telephone. And I made a cane, kind of a Pringles cane, put in a string. It, were, it had a string attached, so two canes, one to the other. Distance of maybe 200, 500 uh, meters. And then you'd shout, I love you. <laughs> with a wave that you know, oscillates in the string, the other person would hear there, and then would put you know, they came from the ear to the mouth. I love you too. So this was kind of the, what we call the half duplex communication, one way and back. But however, there are challenges. It wasn't mobile. So this is why we are angry with the wired communication. And wireless or radio communication became as a favorite to everyone. It makes us mobile. It has many degrees of freedom. And we know for sure that wireless is a disruptive technology. In Africa, for once, we have seen that mobile technology, for example, is really taking, the, you know, taking us to the level that we really see ourselves catching up with the world. So I would like to bring to you that if indeed we are to make communication cheap, we have to be innovative. We have to think on how we can revolutionize or evolve the current landscape of the communication devices that we have, the mobile phones, the smart devices, all this what we have. They're good enough, but they're expensive to use. What can we do? So I have three um, issues, or maybe uh, thematic issues, topical issues, which I have also attempted to address, and I'm looking forward to find partners that together we can do in the next 50 years to see that communication is cheap as I have spelled it. The first thing is to make sure that the communication devices are cognitive, in the sense that they have a brain and a backbone. Number two, they have to be handy. And three, they must be enhanced with applications, as we have heard elsewhere applications. So cheap means cognitive, handy, enhanced with application. Cheap. And therefore, uh, Steve Jobs said that sometimes if we are leader indeed to be innovative, or if we are innovative, we could be meeting in the hallways and the corridors, and one could be sharing with another ideas about what we think is, you know, trendy, or something which is solving the societal challenges. Sometimes I, for one, for example, my students, Call me at 1 a.m. Sir, I have a brilliant idea. Are you at work? And I wake up. 
What's your idea? And then they begin to tell me. This is exactly what Steve Jobs talked about, only that the time is different. He referred to 10.30. We often have these kind of talks, calls, midnight or plus. Brilliant ideas come when you're dreaming sometimes. And as I say it, that what the past technologies and even the devices which some of us have in this room fail to do was that they were only assigned for one function, one purpose. A mobile phone that simply helps you to do the mobile phoning as a mobile phone, nothing more. In other ways, it was like devices, or it is like devices are locked in silicon. So the chip defines what the device do, does. Okay. We are revolutionizing that. We are seeing not only the chip, inside the chip, we create space for a memory, a little brain and some backbone. In which case, we should be able now, therefore, to define what the device can do at any other moment. Even the device itself should be able to think and decide what to do and how to do it best. So from locked devices in silicon to some cognitive software defined devices or radios, for example. One device, I know some of you have smart devices which can work as an FM radio, TV, and phone. But beyond that, we should be able to do much more surveillance and beyond that, we want the device to be your doctor. So this is the future. Software-defined radio is the issue from now onwards. Cognitive radio is the radio that will be able to sense its environment, what frequency is available, and what frequency is busy. And therefore, which channel can I use to communicate best? It will be following the primitive traditional approach of how current flows and that it favors the easiest path. So the radios, the devices will be following the easiest, easiest and also the cheapest path that could be available. So I also have to ask, what's the transit tariff if I go this way? And the device will decide for you before you know it, and therefore you'll be paying very less. And one other thing which will be very key for all these radios, which we cannot do without, is the antenna. I am a master of antennas. Started building antennas when I was three years old, when I put a wire connected to my house, my parents' uh, rooftop, and to a small you know, assembly of transistors. And I got the first radio. I didn't tune to Malawi radio. It tuned to Mozambique, Zambia, the neighboring countries. It was a powerful radio at the receiver, I think, in those days. Therefore, the antenna is very key. The problem has been that all the devices which we are holding most of any time, they are senseless antennas. Not smart enough. I have thought of an antenna that when I put in there, the antenna should be a bit more intelligent. Sense that there is interference. That should not affect your TV, your cell phone, your radio. So therefore, it should reject the interferences. Much more that, if the signal is weak, it must you know, shout or listen more. Because if you were sitting far away from me, I would be shouting even much more. Now that you're closer, I'm able to judge and know at what limit or range I should speak to you. So that the antenna will be able to do. That's the antenna I have worked on and developed and I would like also to show which will be able to be to outdo the traditional antennas, which are like the hanger antennas, which we know popular in our homes, the Yagi antennas. The Yagi antenna, which has been there or is almost in every household, will no longer be useful. Because I, you and I, you know that now we have so many radio uh, systems that are coming in, the TVs, different and stuff. Like that. You don't want to have a farm of antennas at your rooftop. It will obstruct with the out, outdoor deco of your institutions, homes, and stuff like that. So we are also thinking of an antenna that can be a multifunctional, multi-purpose antenna. I found a patent just three weeks ago, right here in Malawi. And then next year, or in the next, yeah, next year, we're doing it in China. <laughs> this antenna is inspired by insects. I believe that insects are intelligent, sometimes much more than I don't want to pick the other person. 
So inspired by insects, and how they sense their environment, how they do their things, and survive sometimes hard conditions, I developed this antenna. So I'll not give much more details because it's fouled. But this kind of antenna has triple play applications. It could be used, for example, in Lilongwe here to receive the digital TV like the Go TV. Could be used for digital terrestrial TV or the UHF TV like the Times TV. Could also be used for television white space. The technology which we are pushing in, broadband internet, to use the idle and free you know, channels that are available. Um, and therefore, to have uh, internet provided to the remotest or disconnected places of this country, for example, Malawi. We started this 12, uh, 2012, and Malawi is in the top five globally pioneering uh, this kind of technology, the television world spaces technology. And we are supporting agriculture, <laughs> health in the virtual diagnosis, in the health, schools, as I will demonstrate what we're happening. The techniques are very simple. We're using GPS scanners and all that just to detect which channels are free and which ones are busy. So that has been our approach uh, ever since. In typical school deployments, what we discovered is that such kind of technologies, if we simply deploy them and go support, sustainability, other issues, other challenges. And therefore, what we have done is we have taken note of very interested young boys and girls in schools to be part of our team, to be trained to become engineers, that they can monitor, maintain, and report issues on the network and benefit from it. So this is kind of a do-it-yourself. And this one, I'm calling it citizen science ship. It's a new term I have coined. So my lab, my offices, my home is full of boys and girls wanting to be in the citizen science ship. Everyone want to be an engineer. Some are high school. In fact, I've recruited them with the University of Malawi. It doesn't permit those who have not been qualified to be in there, but I am permitted to bring in high school, to be inspired. So they sit in my laboratories. These are some of the high school, you know, but they have done the best because I do short listing of the best of the best in the country. So they are doing their circuits making software defined circuits for the future, not for the, for the present most of any time. And as you can see, that small girl, she got 10 points. Uh, she has put a small circuit in there to intercept the traditional antenna so that the antenna becomes a bit more intelligent to reject what it doesn't want and desired signals. And the other students are inspired also to be engineers. So. Thank you very much, but look forward to what will happen in the next, that communication which we love so much to do will become cheap, cognitive, handy, enhanced with applications. Thank you.